Well, I'm going to talk about the most important innovation of the 21st century. Well, I think if I ask each one of you on a more serious note, you will have maybe 100 different opinions on this. So it's a very provocative topic. It's the most important one over 100 years. So I'm going to step back from the individual to a much broader issue. And I was pondering about this question in 1999, in the turn of the century. I said, what was the most important innovation of the 20th century? And I would have thought, as I think many of you, it'll be maybe the internet, or maybe it's wireless communication. So I sort of said, okay, let's make a list of all the things that completely changed our lives. And it'll be something like this. You know, it'll be, you know, maybe airplanes, electrification, it could be polyvaccination, nuclear energy, space, transistor integrated circuits, while, you know, all of these. And what I found, to my surprise, the answer was none of these. And that, I'm sure, is sort of intriguing you. What was it? So let me take you on that journey. And the journey started in the 19th century with a physicist. Who asked the question? Sir William Crookes, who was the president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, and he called upon science in 1898 to save the world from starvation. Why? Because the water quality was improving, the population was living longer, people were living longer, and the population was going up. But the soil, in Europe, in Americas, did not have enough nutrition to grow food for all that growing population. So what, was, what were they doing in the 19th century? They were going to a small group of islands called Guano Islands. And Guano in the local language is bird poop. You see this uh, pretty talented bird out there. <laughs> and there were millions of them landing on these islands in the South Pacific and basically doing the job. And so that was the most nutritious fertilizer. And so what they did, what people did was, oh, is, that's the resource. Then they went, you know, gangbusters out there. They, all these mountains of bird poop, they dug them up, put them into bags, shipped them all over the world, and that's what we used to grow food. And there were better and better ships. The Brits had faster ships than the Spaniards. The Spaniards went ahead of them. Then the, the Germans and the French, they were all competing with each other. And guess what happens when there's a resource like that? These islands, they were, people were trying to decide, do they belong to Peru or Bolivia or Chile? And there, were war, there was war. This was the oil of the 19th century. And people went after this. Even our esteemed institutions in Washington, D.C., Congress created the Guano Island Act of 1856. Did you know that? No. That's what they did. And what was the act? Very simple. Any American goes and occupies a Pacific island, becomes America. <laughs> they started the Occupy movement, by the way. And of course, they didn't find guano out in all the islands. In fact, they didn't find anything, but they became strategically important in the Second World War. But they didn't find anything. So amongst all this chaos that was going on, Sir William Crookes did some simple back-of-the-envelope calculation, saying that we have a problem because this guano is going to run out. And he argued, he said, what are the elements that we need for life? What is there in our food? in our DNA, in our proteins, what we have are four basic elements that we absolutely need. You need carbon, and you get that from plants that fix carbon dioxide. You need hydrogen that we get from drinking water. You need oxygen that we breathe. And you need nitrogen. And the nitrogen is very important, and that is very difficult to get it into our soil. So he argued, well, we have a problem. There's not enough guano, which has the nitrogen. 
but we have like 78% of nitrogen in the atmosphere, why not just take the nitrogen and make them into fertilizers? It's easier said than done, because nitrogen has a triple bond, which is extremely difficult to break. So he, as a physicist, they always do this, they put the challenge to the chemist. <laughs> and said, figure this out. And that started a race. A whole bunch of chemists from all around the world started working on this. Nobel laureates, young, old, everyone, started working on this problem. How to turn atmospheric nitrogen into something useful. And out of this came a young chemist by the name of Fritz Haber. In 10 years, he discovered a catalyst that would break the triple bond of nitrogen and make ammonia, which became the precursor for fertilizers. And that catalyst, by the way, was uranium. This is before the nuclear age. But that was the discovery. That's necessary, but not sufficient. It's good to do something in the lab, but you have to produce masses. Came Carl Bosch, who made mass produce this, made it affordable so that people could use it, and that was the birth of what we now know as chemical engineering. And this is beautifully depicted and written about in this wonderful book, which I would encourage you to read, and that's called The Haber-Bosch Process. And they got their own Nobel Prizes, etc. Why, amongst all the innovations that I talked about in the 20th century, why was this considered the most important, a forgotten story? Because it is all about people. The nitrogen fixed by the Haber-Bosch process is within each one of us in this room. We would not be here to do all the other things that I talked about if it was not for this innovation. This completely transformed humanity, everyone. You could live without the internet. Maybe not my daughter. <laughs> but you could not leave, live without this. So now let's fast forward to the 21st century and ask the question, we're going to have 10 billion people in this world, and if there's something that the whole world and this planet needs, what is it? Well, maybe there are a few ones. Food, certainly one of them. Water, health, as we all heard. Well, if you are to produce all that and deliver, there's something very basic that you need, and that is energy. And most of that energy today, as we all know, is based on fossil energy. And it is, we have a one-way traffic. The more we use, the more carbon dioxide we produce, and we all know the story. This is a one-way traffic from the carbon that we stored out here to the atmosphere, which is having devastating effect and likely have more in the future. And that's the problem. This is not sustainable in the long term over the next 100 years. Now, if you look at the fuels, there's nothing wrong with the fuels. It is this process. That fuel stores the energy that you need, whether it's coal, whether it's natural gas, oil. It's wonderful. The problem is the fossil energy and this one-way traffic. Could we change the ball game, where instead of getting this stored energy in the fuel from the fossil sources, how about if you fade the fossil part and recycle CO2. Could we turn CO2 into oil in the future? So the biggest challenge that we have, the Haber bosch like challenge of the 21st century, is can we turn CO2 into oil? And if you could do that at $2 a gallon, fossil-based fuel becomes obsolete. And so the how, what do we do? Well, you need to store energy in this. And that energy is in the form of hydrogen. And hi because these are hydrocarbons. Where does the hydrogen come from? Hydrogen has to come from water. We have a lot of water. And if you could somehow put energy and split water into hydrogen and oxygen, then we could use that hydrogen. It needs energy. But that energy better be from carbon neutral or carbon free sources. Otherwise, you're back on the treadmill of fossil-based energy. And if you were to make oil 
from carbon dioxide at $2 a gallon, your energy, the carbon-free or carbon-neutral energy, has to be at $20 a megawatt hour. A lot of people thought this is impossible. Well, here's the data. Carbon neutral and carbon free energy at $20 a megawatt hour, wind, electricity from wind is almost there. Electricity from solar is getting there. And if you want to heat biomass and get the energy out of it just by burning, it's already there. So it is the first time in history where carbon free or carbon neutral energy is almost there, the conditions are set. And the race is on. And the race is on to take carbon dioxide, water, add this carbon neutral energy at $20 a megawatt hour, and produce oil at $2 a gallon. And you have to make it at 100 million barrels per day. Why is that number? Because that's what the world uses per day. This is not a trivial challenge. And as you can see, there are various ways of going. It's like going from San Francisco to New York, by all these different freeways. And all four of them are being pursued here at Stanford. I'm on the southern one, using I-10, the, the heat one. It's electricity or light or using biology or using heat. And this is going on. The race is on. I wish I could tell you this is a solved problem. Obviously, it is not but we are working on it. And a lot of people have said, this is impossible, never happened. The best way to address that is a very famous quote by Arthur C. Clarke. Any sufficiently advanced technology cannot be distinguished from magic. <laughs> and just like Haber and Bosch did their magic and completely changed the ballgame, it is now our job to do some magic for you. Thank you.